Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Real Wine People. It's coming in about nine months late, but we got there in the end. Uh, currently New Year's Eve, it's about three o'clock here on the west. Uh, cellar doors about an hour to go. There's people enjoying revving up for festivities and what a crazy year it's been. We had some big plans to do a lot more podcasts between March and now, but uh, with border closures, I couldn't get across to Tasmania, Mornington, uh, South Australia again. So we're sort of stuck. And right now the borders are just reshut with Victoria. So it's been a bit nuts, but it has been a crazy year for us. Went from, um, you know, complete shutdowns here for about six weeks, uh, wondering if we're going to survive and our good restaurant people were going to get through as well to go through and just be one of the craziest years we've had where you've had a few staff changes pre-COVID and then during COVID people stuck, you know, across the country that couldn't come into our state. So we are working pretty hard and then building a new winery um, and yeah, lots of, lots of madness. Also, it was sad to hear um, a friend, Tara Sakota, pass away in October, which was very sad and um, our thoughts with him and with his family I still think about him quite often uh, which was you know all in all been a pretty challenging year for 2020 I hope everyone out there is doing okay uh, this just to, to push ahead here this episode is with Ryan O'Meara of Express Winemakers down in the Great Southern I think probably going forward the podcast will stay pretty much WA centric until the borders open so Ryan and I spoke uh, back in January and then the audio was pretty bad. So we decided to meet up again, have a few more beers and have a chat about um, what he's been up to and, and the year that was. So once again, happy new year to everyone. Here's to uh, an improved 2021 and look forward to perhaps catching up soon. All the best. Good man. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Yeah, lots of lots of tools and equipment. Yeah, yeah, have a good combo. Well, got to work out what we've got to talk about, mate. All right. It's only been. Was that seriously January? Yeah, when last came? time I came down was January, and the last I think podcast I put out was January as well. Have you not even been down here since January? Oh no, I've, uh, you've been down. Oh no, because they they closed the regions, so we tried to get down, and we couldn't even get from Margaret River to. Denmark. I thought you ran the gauntlet one time. We tried, but the, no, we, we applied for the pass and they said no. That's right. And I got one. I got one to come up your way. Yeah, that's right. Mm. You knew how to play the system. Mm. Or maybe you're an essential worker. <laughs> I'm so essential. Yeah. Well, at the moment, just for people who are listening, we are I'm in Denmark, in the Great Southern, speaking with Ryan O'Meara from Express Winemakers, in my wife Naomi's dad's... <laughs> Woodworking shed. Uh, yeah, it's a great um, We're looking at lots of power tools. We're actually recording this sitting on saw horses. <laughs> and what do you call this thing? A table saw, you reckon? We've got table saws and thicknesses. Yeah, you know better than me. Yep. Um, Ryan and I caught up. Oh, we catch up all the time usually because Ryan loves margaritas so much. <laughs> <Bastard. laughs> um, so we caught up back in January for a quick chat. Uh, and of course, the world's gone a little bit crazy since then. So we thought we'd give it a bit of a re-record. I've put no episodes out since yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, no, I've, I've noticed. I've been, you know, I've been one of the people hassling you, just <laughs> constantly peppering you with emails going, Ben, what's going on? Yeah, I know. We had huge plans to go through. Well, we had Tassie, Mornington and Victoria back through South Oz um, and lots of, you know, people lined up. But, of course, yeah, borders are shut. You know, world's gone mad. Um, how's the... Uh, has that, uh, the, the whole COVID thing, how's it affected you down here from the beginning? Um, I think we're probably some of the luckiest people on the planet at the moment. Like the whole time we had like maybe a few weeks of of panic and mayhem. And um, and then since then, been fortunate enough for the isolation to just turn a bit of a blind eye towards it all with a bit of caution yep. thrown in there. But um, yeah, regards that, so that's been... Easy, easy home home life and what what have you has been easy, but um, yeah, watching yeah, the 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 uh, panic that kind of sets in as a business owner, I think trying to have any sort of forecast for what the future holds is 
definitely, um, I don't think I'm alone in that. It's sort of stressed a few people out. But um, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I think like like us, really heavy into restaurants and when all the restaurants were forced to shut, you're like, well, I guess yeah, that's it for us. exactly. You know, I, I thought it was end game for sure, but um, it's, it, you know, it's kind of turned out a little bit the opposite in, in a strange way. It's yep. been a lot of demand for alcohol, as you probably know as well, and it's probably beyond that as well. Um, yeah, there's been a bit of a shift in... Um, uh, people's drinking uh, preferences, perhaps. I think so. Yeah. Because when you we look, well, I looked at the figures, and I'm just diving deep into this now, but the, the figures that we're, we're drinking eight percent less as a nation since COVID started. But I think what's happened is the power has been put back into the purchasers' hands. So you, you're not, if you go to a a pub, you know that could be part of a group which might have a group deal, or could be part of a but might be owned by a big chain or you've only got a choice of, even if it's independent, a choice of maybe 40 wines. So when people are making their own choices, you know, organic food's up 50% Um, since COVID started. And so they're making the choice to go to organic wine or, you know, low impact wine. Yeah, yeah, no, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I hadn't really thought that through to that extent, but um, kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely bottle shops who are getting in touch with me who I wouldn't have imagined my wildest dreams would have ever ever bothered so no it's, it's been it's been good on that side of things but yeah. um you know it's you miss your sydney trips you think the margaritas are better <laughs> there than denmark <laughs> oh it's good to have a year off yeah yeah, year yeah, off margaritas. yeah i haven't been to perth since january either nice oh i had to i went around it to go up north <laughs> and, then, and then yeah to the um ferry to go to rot nest oh jeez. yes no, 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 I've, I've still had family trips to perth but um yeah, not not so many, and it's it's been yeah. I thought it'd be more relaxing year than it has been. It's kind of been, you know, I see looking at you, who's frantically busy with all these different builds on at the moment. But uh, you know, I, I feel a bit um, busier than I expected anyway. Sure. Did you? Um, well, I think maybe we should rewind before mm-hmm. we start going down more rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how how did you? decide to oh there goes Martin see you Martin he's off to Bremer Bay Bremer Bay with the Denmark Surf Life Saving <laughs> Club Mr President yeah. um, so how did you get started in wine and you know what what drove you so how, how did you get started and you know what sort um, of stuff do you do yeah um, I suppose I was just at uh, at school and saw the um, you know, looking at all through all those course books of what courses you can do, and it definitely sounded a lot better than pretty much everything else on there. You get to make booze and travel the world, um, so that was pretty appealing. Um, and then, you know, it's obviously never exactly like you you, you think it's going to be. Um, you know, I was doing uh, wine tasting classes when I was still underage uh, at university, and you know, I had zero or probably above zero but not much um appreciation for for wine and uh, some of the wines that the university was showing us probably didn't didn't help build that really you know we were drinking um cooler bar with uh two grams tartaric acid huh, per yeah. liter added to it you know um just to test you know if you can pick up different um nuances and whatnot but um yeah uh, i think once I, uh, once I graduated uni, I still wasn't 100% sure that it was the right path for me and um, travelled a little bit and got a better taste for it. I, fe- I felt like in the um, in the old world over in Europe, you can kind of see a less industrial side of, of the business, of, of, you know, people there living and breathing it and incorporating it into their lives with food and... and um, just the way they go about things was wasn't all about the bottom dollar and you know, um, how to increase profit and all this sort of stuff. That was. So where did you end um, up in in Europe? Um, was the first? Oh, first I went to the States first when I um, first graduated and was there for for oh, nine months or so, um, and that was a really good first stop. Um, working for a small producer in Santa Barbara in California. And that was you know pretty nice place to be. Cool. And from there, yeah, I ended up actually um, throwing the towel in uh, um, after, you know, after that, coming home and just being like, all right, no, this kind of sucks. 
and ended up working at uh, Little Creatures in Fremantle as a brewer for about two years. And it was really good um, to see, I suppose, the, um, a different industry and the way that they work. And there was a lot more enthusiasm and camaraderie and less, um, you know, uh, I don't know how to put it. Snobbery. Or yeah, 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 that's probably what I'm trying to refer to. I'm not looking for a better word for Throw it. me under the bus, I yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was very, it was more my sort of scene with beer at the time, um, early, two th- oh, no, God knows what, mid-2000s. Um, oh, so they were fairly new there, about five years old or something. Yeah, 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 it was, I was there when it went from um, a private ownership, I suppose, to, to Lion Nathan. Yep. Um, and, yeah, no, it was... It was good to to see and and see what they were doing and it seemed like a higher uh you know they were well more scientific and there was a little bit less subjective i suppose and everything was a bit kind of more grounded um in that way and yeah it was and it was a growth industry as well so whereas wine at the time was probably starting to to um maybe lose a bit of its sheen and people were tightening their belts and the yeah, budget cuts and stuff perhaps around around that kind of era there'd been a lot of money spent in, before then yeah um so you know it was fun being involved but then at the end of the day i was just like oh, i still still liked wine more than beer despite having you know drunk 10 times as much beer as wine in my life um, <laughs> um only yes. 10 yeah. where, where do margaritas fit in on that? <laughs> hopefully a minute percentage <laughs> um so yeah i got back into oh i think i made travel plans made travel plans and then um was flat broke in europe and was like oh what can i actually do here to make money and i was in italy and then Asked, asked around and ended up working in a winery in Tuscany and I was kind of like, oh, it's kind of, yeah, this is, this is good now, this is good. Awesome. So, yeah, no, that was a bit of a, um, yeah, a bit of personal growth had happened perhaps. So you were a uh, seller hand or did you take on? Um, I, yeah, seller hand, a glorified uh, seller hand, you know, assistant winemaker position where I couldn't actually speak the, the oh, language right. and so may as well just drag hoses around. Yep. Um, yeah, so that no, was interesting. Um, the wines we're making were, 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 were all right. They weren't, you know, wasn't Brunello or anything like that. It was apparently only a kilometre away from sure. there. But um, I was going to ask you yeah. where, but now you said their wines are not that great. Uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think they probably still exist. They almost yep. existed as much as a, um, a holiday destination for German tourists. Right. As it did for pumping out wine. Right. Um, what, near the coast? Or? No, uh, no. Like a, um, what do they call it? Agro-tourism. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Sort of for, um, yeah no, it was a- good. A- yeah. Agree tourism? I said agro, maybe that's something ag- to do with Yeah, agree, club. agree sounds yeah. more, more <laughs> accurate. Yeah, so no, that was good fun. And after that, I just kind of snowballed again. I was working in um, Spain and France and then back to Spain again. And then in the off season, I'd come back to Australia and try and earn actual money rather than just putting a roof over my head. Sure. Um, How many yeah. years did that go on for? Um, maybe from 08 to 2011 or something like that. So, yeah, a little while. And then came back to... So when you came back to Australia, you weren't down here. In yeah, the, I did. I was working in um, uh, the Yarra Valley right. in 20, 2009 and then uh, everything caught fire. Yeah, of and course. And then so I was kind of going, oh... They said they'd keep me on, but like the hours were pretty minimal and I was kind of a little bit maybe homesick by that stage. I was like, oh, I'll go back to WA and I had a f- good friend um, working down here in Denmark and I was like, oh, I'll hit him up and he was, you know, desperate for staff and then they came here and I'd been here plenty before holidaying as sure. a kid and I was like, oh, this is kind of good and, the, you know, the Riesling tastes nice and it's kind of inspiring and um, I might stick around for a little while. I didn't stick around that long. I ended up going back to Europe, but I, it was always in the back of my head going, oh, that's kind of a nice nice alternative to, cool. to other areas that I might have considered. And wh- where, where did you work here? Um, it was West Cape Howe and then, and then I probably did three or four vintages there over... When it was at the... Which is now Yeah, Boston starting Brewery. in Denmark and yep. then um, uh, then one year I came back and the winery had moved. I'm like, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's in Mount Barker now. So, um, but not too far up the highway. So, 
Um, yeah, man, I was there for a couple of years as well, and it was good. I was, yeah, it was still still very it was very well, quite large scale compared to what I do now, but um, you learn a lot. And what do you do now, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Stand on grapes and um, yeah, no. This year we've promised ourselves that I'll embrace the industrial revolution a little bit more. Really? Yeah, my, I've got a crusher that probably crushes as much as. Your neighbour who, you know, your old Italian neighbour who yeah. sort of wines, crank wines his, his press through. So I've got, I've actually got two of those. So we could run them oh, simultaneously yeah. or I might um, maybe get a three-phase generator and, and, um, wow. and actually crush grates properly. But um, yeah, no, um, it's been, I suppose, you know, being so far from what I'd ever done with... Um, well, what was the transition? Stomping. So you, you left, you left mm. West Cape Howe. Oh, I started making Express Wine Makers there. The right. final year there, I was, or maybe, maybe final two years, I think. I was sort of just asked, and they were very kind and um, let me. And at the time, I was just maybe pilfering some of the best vineyards that I know that they worked with, yep. which you know I'm sure they loved. Um, I was just like, oh, that's really good. Can I get some of that? And um, there they said yes and so cool. I, I took all I could afford and, and made it into wine and um, yeah so it, it, it's, it's funny because I didn't still back then that was 2011 was our first year sure. and I had no idea what nat natural wine was um, and then probably didn't taste anything like that until probably some stage in 2012 or something like that and they had just the eyes just open you just like oh geez what's this it tastes completely different to what what I'm used to um, and was that in Europe that you tried? But I like it. No, no, it was definitely back home. Yeah. Um, it was just um, that sort of first wave of of natty winemakers all from the Adelaide Hills yep. generally. Um, yeah, no, I can't remember what bottle. I've, once I had one, I was, all of a sudden it was dozens and dozens. Um, so, yeah, no, that was inspiring to me and I d had no, no shame, no hold back in just quickly diverting my course to, to go along that way because the first one to two vintages were just kind of another pop-up brand I suppose slightly more handmade than yep. than others and then was by 2013 I was seeking out organic vineyards um, you know it took a few years to, to sort of become uh, you know exclusively organic vineyards probably was first year of maybe 2016 or something like that right um, and when did you take the leap to go full time into vineyards and everything? No, we're just you're full time for or express wine making. About the same time as vineyards, yep. I think it sort of you can see why they run parallel. You're like, shit, I've got no time of day anymore. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. 2016, I suppose, and I've, I tied it in with another trip back to to working in Spain. Oh, great. Um, and where, where, where in Spain were you working? Um, that, the last time was in Roberto del Duero with yep. Alfredo Maestro. Right. Um, yeah, I just figured I'd, you know, I'd never worked for a natural winemaker before because usually they're pretty solo operations or, you know, with a couple of mates or family. And so, yeah, I was, um, Alfredo was uh, in the Bibendum portfolio, which I was, I suppose, a part of in a way. Oh, within Bebo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and cool. then jumped on... Um, I met Alfredo and his larger than life character and it was uh, I suppose it was almost a look in, uh, unfortunately a bit of a look into the future of like I don't want to be as manic as this guy is but it's kind of going that way yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah but it was it was good and then I suppose I was already looking after one or two vineyards then and then I saw the way that he operated and he was just looking after bunches of vineyards but looking after vineyards in Spain in central Spain is a very different um, thing to looking after them in, in the Great Southern. I think it, it doesn't really rain there. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> the vines are really old and they tap down to some, you know, some deep underground water um, and they don't have much pressure from any any mildew, really. I think they spray once or twice a year. Wow. Um, and then here, I mean, I've been pretty lucky so far. I've probably only seen powdery mildew like once. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm diligent, Ben. I'm diligent. Yeah, I know. I know, Ryan. I know. <laughs> and so, yeah. where did the name Express Winemakers come? Uh, that's was it's a name I, I kind of regret in a lot of ways. Like I wish I had a cooler name. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a cool name. <laughs> um, it was about expressing a sense of place 
Right. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, which you end up having to explain to, to every single um, restaurant and bar that you walk into and try and sell wine. Sure. Um, yeah, it was, it was supposed to be a bit of a, um, what do you call it, double entendre, a bit ironic maybe. Yeah. With the name Express, it sounds like a fast food joint. But, but um, Express as well from out of the press? Or yeah, that's, that's that, that was building was. into it yeah. as well, you know. I was like, wow, this works on so many levels. Yeah, that was so <laughs> clever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. So, no, I mean, that's that's where that kind of came from and then I suppose it's getting to a state now where I'm, I've got um, looking after six or seven different vineyards this year and I mean the idea is always to release a couple of um or well, hopefully at least one uh, single vineyard wine from each site but I'm sort of you know really reluctant I'm wisening up to that as well just going oh it's not always the way I'm as, as excited as I am about a certain parcel doesn't necessarily always translate to the general public. Sure. So yeah. I'm sort of trying to learn the, um, the realities of it. And there's you know, the internal battles that you have. You're like, blend me. Don't blend me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've been through it. Um, yeah. We got two. Yeah. We just yesterday, <laughs> we, um, we have two barrels of Shannon from the site, you know, which we were, we'd earmarked for sort of sparkling, base for uh, the Cremont that we do uh-huh. uh, yeah two of them it's in like three year old white oak it's all um, yeah hand picked and, and you know pressed and just ferment and racked uh, straight to barrel to ferment and just left there the whole time so it's got nothing in it being a, a potential base wine there's no sulfur or anything yeah yeah and now we're, I'm just going I think we might bottle that just as a sans souffre, you know. Yeah, bottle. yeah. So, it, so it's never been topped and it's kind of got a bit of that sort of character. No, it, it's never been topped, but the bung's never been opened. So okay. there's no... Cool. Yeah, it's it's pristine. But whether we can get that from that barrel into a bottle like that, yeah. Yeah, no, I've done it so many times. I've been... I've forced myself. I always go down the path of erring on the side of, you know, bottling individually and, and probably really bad ratio of times of it not looking quite like I imagine. So I don't want to be the the downside of that. I reckon you should bottle it. But um, I've had, you know, Pinots and um, some other examples. That's the one that springs to mind eventually, uh, first up. But um, I've had other wines that I'm definitely like, yeah, that has to be bottled eventually, Uh, you know, by by itself. Yep. And then end up um, regretting it in a way. It sits in the back of the shed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I think it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. we'll see. I can think about it in yeah. the detail. Yeah, yeah, show, show. You have to bring yourself. Well, I'll be up there soon enough. So, I think it's one of those things. We tasted it, and now that the bung has been opened, mm. it's like, well, we're going to make a call. Uh, like, do we bottle it or not? Was it quite oxidative already? Not at all. Zero. Okay. It was, but it's it's the challenge of getting it, you know, to look like that in bottle. So yeah. Transfer it from barrel into. Would you go, yeah, and that's when you always have those internal battles. You go sans sufa or like, or, or add a little bit, and then is that fucking sulfur. it up? Yeah. Or is, yeah. Yep. Oh, fuck. We've got a gas spear, so I might gas spear it direct to the vacuum filler. Yep. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so the, your vineyards, right? Like, if you look after six, they, mm-hmm. some in Denmark here, uh-huh. and Perongarups. Yep. Anyone and else? And Mount Barker. So it's in between. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much three of the five sub-regions of the Great Southern and then the other two sub-regions I've got a grower in each an organic grower in each who I buy from and that's not an intentional thing to be you know you know encompassing all the sub-regions of the Great Southern wasn't wasn't really an idea but um it just kind of worked out that way it's really hard to um to source organic fruit here and that's because it rains (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like cloudy that. now. Uh, it was sunny when I left home this morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the subregions you've you've got? Mount Barker, Franklin. Uh, yeah, Mount Barker, uh, Mount Barker, Perongra, and Denmark. I gr- I have vineyards in, and then Franklin and Albany is the other way. Um, I use different growers. So in Franklin, there's a, a vineyard. I don't know what it's even called anymore. It's changed owners a few times in the last few years. It was Long Claude de Terre um, with Leon yep. Clement, Hazel Grove. Um, and they were doing a you know a great job of running it and it's got some amazing riesling which um i try and get as much of as possible and then uh in albany our orange tractor vineyard which is a little yeah, yeah. quaint little setup there beautiful little 
Is that where the Prince Charles went to? He sure did. There's photos of him everywhere there. Wow. (laughs) Um, Morning Prince Charlie. Yeah, so, yeah, I get fruit from them as well. And, um, but it's literally, there's, there's not many other organic growers. So, that, I mean, that's why I went into growing my own. It's just because I couldn't source anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's still very, I mean, it's either br- br- reasonably broad acre kind of stuff down here almost. And then the small guys just copy the big guys. Right. Yeah. Right. So, just that's what it feels like anyhow. Yeah, yeah okay. There's the, there's, it's very different kind of... Um, to Margaret River where you've got your uh, well-known estates that are, I don't know, quite independent, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. There was that too in, in Margaret River. Like everyone wanted to make Mosswood Cabernet or Lewin Chardonnay. Mm. And, uh, you know, this is going back when I was starting and that's what everyone was aiming to do. And then, you know, it's a different scene now. But, um, yeah, I can see how that can happen. Yeah, oh, I mean, that's that's healthier than, like, down here, it was kind of, I don't know how or why, maybe it was because of the agricultural past here that everyone wasn't even aiming to make Mosswood Cabernet or Lewin Chardonnay. They were just trying to grow grapes make mo- and oh. make wine as if it was a broad acre crop, um, you know? Like, there wasn't, there wasn't a... Um, what would you call it? Like something to aim aim for, even sure. you know. Apart from a, sm- a few producers, you know, um, Forest Hills Riesling has been, you know, that sort of style and, and yeah. what have you for for since you know even before Margaret River, um, and that's. I mean, I think Riesling's what we still hang our hat on down yeah. here, you know. Um, but yeah, I, d- I just sort of mean that it's like like it's almost trying to base themselves on being. Um, what do you? like the Riverina kind of style, oh, okay. you know, like yep. just grow grapes, irrigate the hell out of them and, you know, crush them, get the most extraction out of them, pump that out, fine it. And, you know, and I'm like, well, this isn't the region for that. You know, it's, um, right. it's a cool climate and it wasn't really, the people in it weren't acknowledging that the potential to, to grow premium grapes. Right. That's what it felt like. That's what I was trying to tap into when I first started as well. I was like, you know, there's, there's really... Uh, only a s- small number of people actually trying to make fine wine, or you know, out of out of these um, out of this region, expressive wines, like <laughs> express winemakers. <laughs> yeah, Bastard. cool. Now that makes sense. I mean, there's yeah, I, I've seen it before where it's like okay, the cattle's in there, we we hay in there, we've got canola in that one, and that's where we do the grapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, cool. And so, so, what sort of um, how many different wines are you making? Um, I don't know. I'm trying not to make too many. Um, but that they had the same problem we were referring to before where it's um you like oh that needs to be separate to that yeah. <laughs> um yeah. yeah no i'll try to keep it to maybe less than a dozen oh that's um, good um yeah you know that's try, try. Yeah. Usually it usually drifts a little bit over that but some of them are you know one year one year wonders yep um and the distributors love that you know <laughs> I oh, know it's hard yeah. <laughs> label designers <laughs> yeah so you've got you do um Riesling, Shiraz, you're doing skin ferment, so orange wines. Yep, yep. Petions, which at the start you were calling Shannonade. Yeah, yeah, I've still I've, I've made a re, uh, return this year. Right, retro look. Yeah, it's come back in large format. Nice. Um, yeah, no, oh, it's Shannonade's, um, yeah, but it's a, a pet nap made from Shannon in the yep. first year we got it. I, I think I must have been looking for some Semillon or something for a blend. And then I've got semi on, but I've got Shannon. Someone said, "No, oh, well, when you got Shannon, well, when life gives you Shannon, make Shannon aid." That was the oh, really? That was the uh, slogan. So, um, and what what inspired that? Um, I was trying to work out. I just knew there must be an easier way to make sparkling wine yeah. than method champagne wine. <laughs> <laughs> Riddling, disgorging. Yeah. yeah. So it was literally from that. I was just like, "There's got to be." And then I was just like, "Why don't people do it like that?" And I'd worked. At Little Creatures making the bottle conditioned pale ale as well. Yeah. So I was just like, oh, you can just do that. And then we did it. And the first one tasted a little bit like lightly sparkling sherry. Right. Um, for, um, oh. In 2013. Yep. And then sort of, yeah, quickly got the hang of it and then work it, worked out how much sugar to leave. And, you know, there's a, there's a fair few different ways you can do it now. But, um, 
none of them are less risky than the other. No. <laughs> and then I, now they start getting phone calls from people from larger wineries going, um, how do you do that? And can you do it for us? Yeah, <laughs> I've had a few of those too. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when, you know, I guess we were doing it around the same time and you just, there was no recipe for it. The, no, I mean, pet nap wasn't even coined, I don't think, as a term by that stage. Yeah. Uh, we were looking up the EU rules for Petion and what it meant. And so the first year we had a Shannon, which was fermenting away. And we, we sort of worked out from, you know, the old calculations you do when you do sparkling, your pressure versus sugar yeah, and dissolved yeah. carbon dioxide. And I was like, well, it's got to be two atmospheres, not four, uh, according to EU rules. So then we need like <laughs> half the amount of sugar. So you get the test done on the juice as it's fermenting. It's like, oh, we've missed it. You know, it's like it's too dry. So we pitched some Shiraz juice in and bottled it. And it went, um, we, we loved it. We thought it was great, but it was super mousy. Uh, like anything with, with these wines, you know, yep, because of the, the, the oxygen that's in it and whatnot. And lots of tart traits and lots of mud. <laughs> um, and so we ended up throwing it out. But oh. I kept I, I kept a couple of bottles. There must be, I still must have them somewhere. Shit, I'd be like, I'd like to... Uh to sample one of those because the mousiness leaves after three mm. months once the you know the redox potential goes back the other way um so that was a bit of a pity so then we started freezing juice um because we couldn't keep up with bottling that much that quick with hand cappers and yeah yeah you're watching the clock the whole time and then yeah. you're, you're checking the um the sugar levels and they're going down and you're like shit how do we keep this somewhat consistent <laughs> yeah and to keep less crystals in there you know which cause more foaming and whatnot so yeah yeah we worked out if we could get the look get it through ferment and malo as well uh especially in barrel then it would shed a lot of the crystals in barrel mousiness wouldn't be a concern and then we'd pitch the juice back in and you know get it going again but Magic. So. yeah no we i haven't haven't gone down the path i suppose because it's such a quick thing that happens every year and it's the, the busiest time that haven't gotten on top of you know keeping track of what what's actually going on malo wise before bottling those wines um i have checked a bunch after bottling yep and they usually usually through yeah um uh, but yeah a lot a lot of the time i tend to come from have been coming from barrel so perhaps they've been uh more titrate stable for that because i haven't had as exactly. many problems with i mean I've, i definitely get titrates but i've never made one that's that's super explosive like some of the ones that i've seen around which is sure which is a nice problem to have until it happens to me sometime. yeah 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 that's it yeah i mean we've had the, the tartrates was only the year that we just caught the ferment so you know straight from tank into bottle so yeah, the, the yeah. barrel stuff yeah it seems to be pretty good yeah but we've got a kappa attachment to our bottling line this year so we're going to be capturing as much Smashing as possible. Smashing it. I, I might be sending some up the highway to you. Yeah, do it, mate. <laughs> do it. Come to where it's sunny. If I yeah. See, yeah. <laughs> It'll be bone dry by the time it gets there. Yeah, that's it. It always is perfect to bottle the day that everything is ready to pick on that other block. You know, yeah. it's going to take you two days to do or something. Yeah, you know. no, it's 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 not a great deal of fun, but um, the end product is. Yeah. That's what it's all about. For sure. <laughs> cool. And... Uh, Orange wines. What are you making? You know? uh, so I mainly use Riesling. Um, and I mean, I've used Sam and Sav as well. But Riesling's the one that I kind of like to draw the flavour from, if that makes sense. Like it's always the bigger component in the blends. And then to the extent that in the recent years, I've, um, when I've made, uh, you know, white wine Riesling, a direct press sort of one, I've, I've hang on, hung on to the skins and then chuck right. them in with um, like a, a Sauvignon or a Semillon yep. ferment, um, you know, in the, in the right ratios. And secret ratio. Yeah, the secret ratio. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, so those uh, skins are quite aromatic. But yeah, yeah. They're, they're bullshit, but they're, um, they're also, I suppose, a bit um, phenolic as well. I yep. really, you know... Traditionally, Rieslings are, you know, they find the bejesus out of them for a reason, you know, because there's a lot of grip there in the skins. Um, but, yeah, so much flavour and really unique flavours. And there's not, it's not like a one blanket, you know, it's not a musket flavour, like not only musket flavour anyway. There's different sites have different sort of um, expressions. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's been... Um, fun playing with that in recent 
years and I'd like to be honest like at the moment it's probably my favorite thing to make my favorite right. thing to drink yep. and yeah is it all like 100 percent skin ferment gear yeah yeah no it's and it's not very long like i i i actually haven't um delve too much in their long-term skin contact sort of stuff just because it looks so good after about five or six days i'm like just press it get it off yep you know and one one time i'll eventually become brave enough and leave a small parcel hopefully this year on there for a bit longer and see what what happens but i have tried a bunch that are left on longer and you know it's it is more a drying kind of character that it gets to it and i'm just trying to make something that's um juicy and drink now and yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so um you know and i, I need to whip out a few of the, the first skin contact ones that i made to to see what what becomes of it you know i haven't yeah. done that for a while cool um but yeah no i was just really enjoying making and, and drinking that sort of thing at the moment and what's it called <laughs> Lo orange nice was it did have a shorter name right uh, yeah no it's um yeah it was was orange and um Orange, the the region in Australia, uh, we weren't, weren't too happy about that. So yeah, yeah, they yeah. Um, wrote me a strongly worded letter via <laughs> Wine Australia. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I, I received that letter, and then I made, made the appropriate changes with the sure. letter L. We also made appropriate changes. Yeah, and no, I've seen yours. Yep. Yeah, it's it's good. It's nice to see we're all acknowledging. You know, there are the laws in in place and the the gis and and exactly. all the rest you know all the colors <laughs> yeah for those that uh, i guess i should explain it for those that don't know there's a, a wine region in new south wales called orange so just like they can't call their wines margaret river we can't call our wines orange because it's a recognized region it's just unfortunate that it's also a color and mm. a fruit but <laughs> But that's, yeah. you know, that's the way it goes. So ours is, uh, was called Orange 2. That was an oversight. Orange but, 2. No, so it was... Oh, and, Orange and, as well. As yeah. well. Yeah. Um, Orange 2. <laughs> the electric boogaloo. I was like, damn, I was going to use yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. I'm Orange 3. <laughs> um, so, but now we've, yeah, corrected that based on advice from Wine Australia as well. And it's now called Orange in Colour. You can also call it Orange in Hue, apparently, mm. according to the... Uh, the document. Might be like Huey's Orange Dreams is be my next star. Uh, right. Yeah. Ryan's Chocolate Orange. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm glad we're not live right now and that you've got the ability to edit anything. Uh, I'm editing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice. laughs> <laughs> ah, funny. Um, all right. Mm. Are you closest to the beer there? Just I, near that yeah, uh, yeah. screwdriver tape measure. Saw. Saw. These go well. Luckily, we're really close to Newtown. Oh, no, you're drinking Newtowners like a cool cat. <laughs> That's just really tasty. Yeah. Um, i got no fingernails left. <laughs> so your your vineyards you're running... That's a great sound. It that is. sounds really good with that. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Martin. You're driving... Um, you're running them all yourself, spraying them all yourself. Yeah, me and a couple of young guys working for me. Um, cool. They're both part-time. They're both great. Um, yeah, they're both so much smarter than I am, so I feel like, yeah, I'm always sort of trying to justify telling these guys what to do and one's a software engineer and the other one's he could be anything really if he wanted to he's just so like really a guru at at growing things essentially wow so yeah no they're great people to have working for me but they could be earning a lot more working for someone else yeah yeah i won't i won't tell them to listen to this so, <laughs> so if you were to leave your door here in denmark and go to the front gate of every vineyard Jesus. and return home how long would that take i'm glad i've never done that i've gone close i've gone maybe four or five um it'd be a whole day it'd be dawn till dusk at least right without getting out of the car oh um no, just if you got to the gate you know tap the gate oh yeah no no you'd get home before dusk if you didn't get out of the car so like 12 hours or something I don't know, uh, Denmark to Franklin River. Oh, I don't run any in Franklin River. That's just, but we did spray uh, someone's vineyard in Franklin River this year because I get a lot of fruit from it, which I quite like. Right. And he hadn't put any sprays on. So despite not running that vineyard You're spraying it. Yeah. at times, I'm like, please do it. Um, yeah, no, so, oh, no, so I suppose if just going to the vineyards that I actually run, um, it'd be, you know, it's, it's 45 minutes to Mount Barker and then you can hit three up in Mount Barker 
and then up over to the prong ups is probably another 25 minutes and there's two up there and then back to Denmark. So, no, it'd be a few hours. It would, right. yeah. I almost did that the other day and we, we've only got one functioning spray unit at the moment um, and one functioning tractor. So we, like, I've got a track, a uh, truck, sorry. What <laughs> tractor's functioning? Um, oh, it used to belong to <laughs> Ben Gould of Blind Corner Wines. <laughs> the Red Sarmo. It's beautiful. I love that thing. I like that photo you sent me of driving off the <laughs> ramp the other day, being held I, up by rocks. I was not driving at the time. <laughs> uh, uh, I had to keep a very cool head in, um, uh, yeah, but the, the, yeah, the young fellow driving it, was doing everything that he could to get it back on the ramps, but we end up calling um, the tow truck driver, and he was a, a guru at getting it back on the truck somehow. And that's why I've got two cases of wine. The car he lives across the road. Right. Yeah. From here. Yeah. So he he got in the tractor and drove it. So what happened is the the tractor travels from vineyard to vineyard on the back of a truck, mm-hmm. a flatbed truck, and then you drive it down a set of ramps. Three thousand five hundred dollar flatbed truck at that. Oh hello. You got that in Albany? Was that the... Oh, no, that was on you were going to... No, it is in Albany. It's got, like, Albany... Um, what is it? Insulation. Albany insulation. Oh, thank you, Albany yeah. insulation, for all your insulation <laughs> needs. Uh, and you were driving down the ramps to get it off at a site, and the front tyre slipped off yeah, the Yeah, or we just trying to centre it. I think it was trying to centre it. Right. I wasn't driving, remember. That's um, right. And then so as you were driving this right. <laughs> <laughs> I think turning the wheel as the ramps were going... Uh, the front wheels were on the ramps and then all of a sudden the chassis on the ramps and the wheels are suspended in oh. midair and it's a pre- it's a predicament that you don't want to find yourself in we tried a few things and i can't believe um the young guy working for me was jumping back in the tractor wow. while it's hanging over the edge of a truck and but you had it supported by rocks under the front oh well, that was just us trying to get some traction sure. on the wheels so what did the tow truck driver do? Oh, he's worked his magic with the tow truck with the um the lift the tilt tray got underneath the chassis there oh. and so we ended up driving it onto the tow truck and then driving reversing it back onto the truck Right. Yeah, I, I thought we were really You're up to creek. For. We were pretty close to just going, all right, Dan, you hop in the tractor, I'll hop in the truck, and we just drive as fast as we can in opposite directions. <laughs> oh, jeez. Who was in the truck? You were going to be in the tractor. No, I was going to be in the truck. What the... <laughs> <laughs> Looking after your workers there. That's great. <laughs> Right, so I interrupted this wonderful Same working tractor that you bought. <laughs> it was in top condition at a cheap price. Yeah, the ground's quite soft. It would have bounced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many spray units and tractors are you running? Two of each? Um, yeah, two tractors. One I leave um, on site at, at, at the winery vineyard and the other one just does the rounds. And spray unit, where have we got? We got... Um, just kind of borrowing one at the moment. Mine's out of action with a hydraulic pump issue. And then another one, but which we were running, is um, got a gearbox issue. So, yeah, we just, we're just really strapped for equipment. So, yeah, the truck is the one, the consistent thing. It right. All, uh, you know, it links oil like a sieve, but it um, just top it up every now and again <laughs> and it just gets to the next site. And then you just, whoa, you live to see another day yep. and you put another spray on and... Yeah, you're, you're away. And then that buys you about a week or so in time and then you have to do it all again. So it's yeah, this, this time of year, um, we haven't, haven't really experienced it quite this intensely before. Wow. Yeah. Um, Six vineyards. So, uh, well, the two of them, two of them we spray by foot or hand foot. Um, yeah. We've got a backpack spray. There. One's one acre and one's one hectare. Oh, that's the Riesling Parongara? Yeah, there's a little vineyard in the Parongara ups that's um, looking great at the moment, actually. Cool. And we've put some lime on this year, as well as um, some guano and a few other trace elements and stuff. Uh, and that combined with a wetter, wetter year. Yeah. Um, it's looking looking pretty fantastic, but... How's it all? Do you get yeah. weevil issues down here? Yeah, we are now, yeah. Right. And that's up there, actually. I did have done a few moonlight sprays up there with some of um wolf stuff and yeah, yeah. yeah Boof's magic chemicals um that i haven't done one this year actually i was going to do one sunday's full moon i was going to be up yeah. there um but i haven't run that past the the missus yet 
Um, oh, right. Yes, you yeah. are the father of a new child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, nighttime sprays aren't appreciated that much. I mean, I don't really like doing it that much anyway, so I don't, yeah. don't really mind. But, yeah, trying to get on top of the weevils with these um, Chinese herbal the sprays. The matrix of the softer. The, the matrix yeah. of the softer. And, like, it was hard to see a direct impact last year in one, in, in this putting it on. But... um. I, uh, I've I've heard of at least and seen results that other people are getting, and um, it, it's important, I suppose, while the vines are young and there's lots of, you know, green shoots and they're still you're not strong enough. But the vines actually every year, every subsequent year, they've gotten stronger anyway, so they've been become less susceptible. I feel to weevils. Sure. Unless I talk to you in another month's time, I'm like, yeah, it was just a matter of time. Well, we thought we killed it this year, so it's been a, a fairly wet year. Um, start to the season anyway lots of moisture in the ground and but we still have green cover between the vines which yep. it's starting to brown off now but okay. um, and all the vines got away early and strong and we're like oh we killed it look at us go high fives everywhere and then yeah just to the last couple of weeks we've gone hard yeah we're squashing by hand I mean we've, we've used Dyson vacuum handheld vacuum yeah, cleaners no, I'm which saying works what you've quite done. well uh, we've done Matrix Softer. Um, there's some also organic yeast strains that has uh, been isolated. You'd like this. Have I told you about this? Mm-hmm. It's been isolated from uh, the mezcal plant, which is a major ingredient in margaritas, <laughs> uh, which is they... So there's this yeast, three yeasts actually, that grow um, on the back of this beetle that eats the margarita cactus or whatever. It's, uh, it's not called cactus, it's called something else. Uh, agave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and sort of eats them from the inside out. So they've isolated it in a certified organic way and uh-huh. um, prepared correctly. Yeah, we've had success with that as well. Okay. Yeah. And how does the Matrix and Softer go? Uh, we've unknown. Been, yeah, it's unknown. I mean, if you... So it's a sort of a tonic for... It's, it's like a leaf tonic that has the other effect of... So it strengthens the leaves... Um, which, you know, does help against weevils, but then it gives weevils, I think... Bellyache. Bellyache and numb jaws or something like that. Yeah. And they, yeah, go off the boil. Do, well, um, do your established vines still suffer from weevil damage? This is the thing. So we've got... We've been doing restructuring. We've got quite an old... Well, you know, not, not that old, but um, 20-something-year-old vineyard. So we have some very established vines, and we're at the point we have to restructure some of the uh, spur prune blocks. Yep. Yeah, we, we have only had this vineyard for four years, but we've restructured. It's 20 hectares. We've restructured one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, probably five hectares. And then another two hectares we've grafted. So we've got a block of Shiraz, which is dry grown. And it's right next to a irrigated block of Merlot that's been grafted. These, um, and the Merlot is being hammered, every vine, but you can step two metres away. And this whole block, does, you can't find a weevil in it. So, All right. Yeah. Well, maybe they've got alternatives, like younger, softer I think alternatives. so, yeah. Well, obviously, those the vines that we're restructuring, the vines that we're grafting, you know, they're sorting out their plumbing and they're in a sort of shock because, yeah. you know, where they used to send the sap and everything's gone, so they're not getting... They're just trying to... Yeah, their immune systems are compromised because the roots might be pulling up, you know, all their starch reserves to push out, but now they've got to build new pipes as opposed to... Having just going into the old channels and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, so they've been getting a bit hammered. Hammered. Yeah. Hammered. Bummer. I know. Thought we had a win. Yeah. Squash them by hand. That's what we're doing now. The vacuum cleaners come back out again. Yeah. Try um, yeah, no, I've just probably turned a bit of a... I've had other things to do, I suppose, that um, have distracted me from, from night sprays. But, um, I mean, I hope... Yeah, that it's not just the... F- the fact that I'm ignoring it, that it looks better. But, um, I mean, and then I, the other thing I was going to talk to you about, like with those, because this time of year I'm usually, um, or everyone's usually desuckering the yep. the trunks of the vines, I get so so caught in two minds when um, I see all the weevil damage in those suckers, I'm just like, I'm just going to leave them there. Weevils can have that. Yep. And I'm I'm just going to walk past it and then it saved me working say you know and potentially save some growth that's further up the trunk sure um 
What's your take on that? Definitely leave it, even as an indicator. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, yeah, used to, yeah. they used to put... Um, well, you just tackle it when it comes to pruning the following year. Well, yeah. Or later in the season. Or later in the season, yeah. Or, you know, yeah, that's right, when you're pruning, you can do it. Yeah. A bit like the roses, you know, the old idea of the rose at the end of the row for powdery, but we've sort of sorted that problem out now, so now they just look pretty. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, yeah, we leave it there to indicate, you know, when they're on the move. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, yeah, that'd be yeah, particularly important with you guys if, you, if you're actually actively tackling these these things. And I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if they're worse where you guys are. I think it's definitely gotten a lot worse down here over the recent recent years. But um, I suppose most of the vineyards I look after, I haven't done gra haven't been grafting sure. or re-establishing you know that so they kind of feel like they're in a bit of a um safety pattern kind of yeah okay well we still know. we still leave the suckers on uh everywhere yeah, yeah. across the whole block just as cool. an indicator or and we just do it later yeah it doesn't really take that that much longer to do it or if your contracting costs that much more to do it yeah but what that does allow you to do is you know that where they are so if mm. you were to want to do a night spray yeah yeah you're not spraying an entire canopy of vines you're just hitting each trunk yeah yeah and you can get through a lot quicker and, and earlier in the season but they you know yeah i meant to hit it earlier this season as oh, well. you, we're all meant to do lots <laughs> of things you know it's yeah you turn your back for a second it, it really feels like it in two weeks we went from paradise to you know what's going on yeah all right. Weevils. Good times. Fun. Yeah, no. You've Must be all the rain dirty. down here that keeps them uh, oh, alive. Oh, no. I see dirty Margaret River people have put <laughs> them down here. <laughs> uh, no, we never got the pass to get through when the regions were locked. Maybe <laughs> you brought them up or brought them back with you. I think they've been around a bit longer than uh, yeah, I think so. region borders. I was putting... They don't, they, so they don't get them over east at all yet? No. Well, I, th I think yeah. they exist, but nothing like what yeah. we get here. Yeah. Is that is, is that just the introduction from all the South African stuff we've got here? Maybe. I think they're native to South Africa, were they? I'm, I'm that's what I've heard. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I don't want to be caught in a we've racist battle. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Let's divert. We'll check that yeah, <laughs> later and get back to everyone. But, uh, yeah, and then I think, you know, because it, it is a, a more... It's a problem here more than anywhere, and we're a really a blip in... You know, the whole Australian yeah, yeah. scene. I don't think there's much research going into it. No, so that's it. No, Evo and Buffers were you know, they were top of the top of the research chain. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so we just keep going, keep squashing. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So all right, mate. So you, at the moment we're what are we November. Vines are growing. You any changes I to the uh to the wine so you, yeah you haven't talked about your wine making yet so a lot of everything's well fermented yeah yeah um i suppose i um, i just wanted to make my wines as different as possible from the wines that i'd been making um for other people in australia other companies for for however many years and the easiest way to do that i think was was um wild ferment um and then everything it sort of starts to make sense a lot more saves you a lot of money as well yeah um, 50 bucks a pack now yeah yeah this is funny like everything's kind of so so connected in in the sense that once you stop stop doing one thing you can stop doing this stop doing that that other thing that you were doing and you just realize that you're not paying all this money to these um chem chemical companies and um it's it's pretty uh easy going but um yeah i mean i've had uh, the same or probably less stuck ferments from from wild yeast than I have with packet yeast anyway you know like that's that's a lot of people's fear perhaps oh, yeah I'd have to say the same yeah I mean that, that it, you know it does happen and then you just stick the barrels outside in the springtime and hopefully they get through I've got a few that need sticking outside this year but yep. They're kind of not at that level where it's it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's it's just it's a manageable kind of level, and I've done it before, and it, and it, and it works. Gets through. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's it's a it's a fear thing that um that stops a lot of a, a lot of our other wine makers taking the plunge and just not using things. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. Is, I don't know is that, if that's what. Sorry, that's my dog. Where is she? Uh, no, that's, that's, <laughs> I think there's some kangaroos outside. Okay. No, she's, she's, she should be right. 
Uh, yeah, it's it is an interesting one. We, you know, with the whole yeast thing. The <laughs> what's up? Sit. Wait. So the stuck ferments we've had have been our own fault. Like we're going okay if we air dry this and, you know, ah, and yeah, then the yeah, sugar yeah. concentration gets to you know seventeen percent potential alcohol. <laughs> you know you are going to get some stuck ferments, yeah. and it's you you don't test it or check it, and that's or enough or watch it, and yeah. you, that's when the issues can come in. What's your dog's name again? Frankie. Frankie. Frankie is excited about kangaroos. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's seen plenty before, but she'll calm down soon enough. Uh, and then, so no acid additions? Yeah, no acid additions. I think the first year, maybe I did in 2011. I'm not sure. I can't recall. Yeah. But, um, yeah, quickly just threw that out. Um, yeah, no, it's quite liberating doing all that. Like, you know, it's it feels like you're actually, um, you know, and then combine that with... with taking care of the vineyards yep. it was like you're actually doing something rather than in the past perhaps working for other companies and you're just kind of like you're just making this um formula sure. to, for this product that will and how does that compare to beer when you say buying in the grain and buying in the hops um yeah good question haven't we I have addressed this before, but I can't, it was a while ago. It was just when, yeah, I only just yeah, thought yeah. about it. It must um, be like vintage every day as well. Yeah, that, and that's what you always said. I think there's a few other former winemakers in, in my brewing team. Um, yeah, it's, it is different, but yeah, vintage every day. The product is a lot more homogenised. You're getting these malts from from the um, malt house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, and then the hops. Everything's a lot more calculated, I suppose. Sure. So in that way, it's even more more extreme in 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 that sort of thing. But you're not trying to correct anything. Um, uh, you know, like you in, when in the brewery you, or yeah, yeah. Like once when you've got um, in most wineries I've worked in, you know, you get the analysis and you're like, all right, sure. this is shy of what we want. This is shy of what we want. This We're going to correct, correct it Correct the pH to this by adding tartaric. Yeah, yeah. Put the yeah, and tannin in to get the colour. Yeah, no, I mean, I did that for years and then didn't think anything of it. And then um, once I stopped doing it, you get these wines and they've just got so much more more life and vitality to them, you know. The, the numbers might be out by a little bit. But they're only out based on what you were taught. Exactly, exactly. In university as well. Yeah, and, yeah. And I guess university's so much more about looking forward. Commercial, make sure everyone's backwards. employed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that as well. Yeah. And of course, you know, a lot of the research comes out of oh, there. Right, oh, yeah. You know, you've got, if there's a new product, whether it's a cross flow filter or a, um, a new tannin or whatever it might be, you know, they, they'll be tested in, and introduced into the curriculum because mm. universities are where the, the new stuff happens, yep. you know. A lot of things that I was I was taught at university, they're great or what have you, but they're for a purpose, they're so that you can work in a large commercial winery and produce wine and sell wine and stuff. But um, do you think what you what you by by learning the rules though? Or yeah, you, yeah, you, I know you where you're going. Help, help to bend them a bit better. You know, you know mm. that okay, sure, the pH might not be great, yeah. but it's not completely out of the spectrum where things are going to go. Horribly yeah, yeah, wrong. I'd hate to not have any education in yep. winemaking at all. Um, and I, you know, some people who don't they do a fantastic job without it. You know, but yeah. um, I, I think I need I needed that at least. But I think I've pretty much finished with it in a lot of ways. Yeah. I've felt like I've. You've Look, peaked. I've peaked. <laughs> I'm going downhill. So now that everything you, that I learn at university, yeah. anyway, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Most things now I've sort of taught taught myself in a way, usually inspired by somebody or yep. you know, um, having done something similar in the past, and then you just kind of learn from your own mistakes, and they can be pretty costly. But yeah. um, hopefully, you've minimised that and. You just keep winging it. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's true. And I think, like, what I found, it's quite liberating. This is going to sound counterintuitive, but it's quite liberating to put restrictions on yourself. So to, to restrict yourself from, you know, saying, okay, I'm, I'm not going to use packet yeast. I'm not going to correct the acid. And giving yourself those, yourself those restrictions just opens up creativity other doors yeah it's like how do i fix this then you know i've made this rule now this is something i haven't thought of before how about we do this and you end up coming up with 
things you might not have tried before, you know, like Yeah, us. no, that's awesome how that works like that. I hadn't yeah. thought of it that way. I've thought of that way in the vineyard a few times where you're, um, you know, you put restrictions on yourself because I'm not um, certified organic. There's no reason why I can't do any of these things, but I like to be really hard on myself because once you start Slippery letting slope. things slip, yeah. you just can do anything you want. Yep. So I'd be really hard and it does make you think outside the box and um, – do two different do things a little differently in the vineyard but yeah the winery is exactly the same you um you kind of yeah it's, it's amazing you're like sort of all right if i pick this bit this parcel earlier yep you get this amazing natural acid from that and that can be a great blending tool um or you know just to, to a few passes when you when you when you're picking um yeah yeah to build different um flavors in the in the profile so yeah no it's it's Oh, I've never really thought of it like that before, but it's um, it does make you become force you to become more more yeah. creative. I know there's a saying there. I'm trying to think of it, but it's something about something is the mother of invention or Frank Zappa and the mother of invention. What? Mother, uh, uh, you know that the yeah, no mother anyway. of invention. I'm sure everyone's just riveted now that? to yeah, our yeah. Let's Google that shit. Too many, too many new towners. <laughs> so what's next for necessity? Is it necessity? Uh, maybe. Oh, okay. So that has nothing to do with what I was talking about. Necessity? We still need to do shit. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> 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 the editor's coming in hard after this. Yeah. No, I think we're doing all right. I might just leave, let it run. <laughs> so uh, the your, yeah, Express Winemakers, what's what's new? What's next? Where do you have you got a uh, like an end goal? End goal. Um, yeah. Well. Well, the last the last week was the first time I've actually rung real estate agents and gone on tours of places to really? um, to try and find something um, some yeah some digs where I can set down some roots but um, nothing was too forthcoming but that first first go yeah meeting some other people tomorrow I'm sure I'll talk to you about all right is, um, is this existing places or, or no you? no no it's all they're all fresh fresh country virgin land virgin land which has had thousands of cattle on it um cool yeah so no that's that's good i mean i'm interested in doing something slightly different to what's perhaps been done down here before in way of the areas of the land sure. i don't know i'm probably gonna wasn't uh, there a plan <laughs> which if you don't want to answer this, yeah. you don't have to. But were you looking at a wine bar? Down here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was pretty short-lived. Okay. Yeah, no, we, we, yeah, we, we, us and, and another um, bunch of awesome people down here, we were thinking about that. But then I had a, a baby again, another one, and that yeah. was, um, yeah. Between I, that, the night spraying. Yeah, I was just like, wow, when did I think I was going to ever attend this bar? <laughs> and in hindsight, it's been the beautiful blessing going, thank God I didn't do that because I'm struggling to, to stay awake as is. Yep. So I know that, and, you know, it could build that into the other future plans with vineyards and stuff, I think. So get your own place, plant a vineyard, move a, move your winery there? Definitely, definitely. The winery yeah. would, and would go And a little cellar door, yeah. some chickens. Yep, geese, 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 they're the future. Yeah. So they can, well, the geese will get rid of all your weevils. Yeah, yep. No, my, um, one of the guys who works for me is a bit of a goose shepherd. Really? Yeah. Do they have a name? Oh, I was calling him Mr. Goose Shepherd. Calling Mr. Gosling. <laughs> Mr. Gosling. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan and the Gosling. That's it. Yeah, that. no, he's... um. Yeah, it was took me the whole drive home because we do a lot of carpooling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, now we were talking about um, gizzards, the gizzards of, of different poultry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, he's, just, he's a wealth of information. Right, gizzards aren't foie gras, that, that's liver. But yeah, I don't know how gizzards play in with So what, what was, tell me oh, about gizzards. Well, no, he was just saying how these... Um, geese eating rocks essentially and that it was their bodies were using it to help build the gizzards which can process some um all sorts of uh grasses and whatnot and seeds wow that is a 
Cool. I well, should yeah. go carpooling with you. This yeah, amazing. oh, mate, I'd enjoy my carpools. You should start a podcast called Real Gizzard People. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> King Gizzard and the something, something. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, so that's the future at the moment. Yeah, geese and, um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, land, land would be nice. I mean, we we really don't want to move from Ocean Beach, as I've told you before. I mean, it's a lovely place, um, and but you probably also realise that the soil is nothing but beach sand. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dirty beach sand. It's like black beach sand. Oh, I'm looking at this lovely grey beach sand. Right. Oh, sorry, grey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then I was like doing this very basic internet research, and I was going, oh. In Colares in uh, Portugal, they grow these vines in beach sand, only metres from the ocean. Yeah. And they've got, they just put these bamboo stakes all around that act as a windbreak and the, the vines grow in a snake-like pattern on the ground. And then they put a little bamboo stake, which suspends the fruit. Oh, yeah, that's a bit of hard work. Yeah, and then I thought about it for longer than three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, but it would be very nice to have um, some property that backs onto Back Beach and have a four-wheel drive and just be able to go surfing down there. That's true. Whenever you want. Mm. So. Nice <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, anything else you want to? Uh, we've done over an hour. Have we? Yeah, look at us go. Where's the time? It's only two beers. That's got to be a record for us. Isn't it? <laughs> That's probably probably good for the best. All right. Um, people can find you expresswinemakers.com mm-hmm. and all the Insta handles. Um, to explain the uh, inside margarita joke, <laughs> how did that start? Um, Wasn't it that wine show? The but one at the Treasury at buildings. The, yeah, yeah, at the state building. So it basically boils down to Mike Benny. Right. Right. So we, that's right. We finished that gig and then I bought us some margaritas at the bar. Uh huh. And then that by default became. Oh, well, yeah. That our was the drink, drink of the, the night. night. Yeah. I was well primed already. Yeah. And then you had a series of unfortunate incidents. I, I phantomed and, uh, yeah. and went to Bastard. bed like a, a grown up. And, and I was I was asleep on the side, not even on the side of the road, pretty much on the road. On the road. And had people drag me off the road, people yeah. who we were drinking with. But right. And, and ever then, since then, <clears throat> well, I've tried to find out where you're going to be and when when you're in the trade. Ha. And I call ahead and get a margarita served to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been very effective. <laughs> very effective. Like to, I think you've crossed state boundaries with it, actually. I think there's been times where I've been... Oh. Maybe not interstate, or definitely regional. I've definitely been in Perth, and then you've we've, you've been up, you know, nowhere near me. Yeah. And I've had a margarita served to me, courtesy of Ben Gould. <laughs> and then there was the time that last Christmas we were staying at um, Crown in in Perth for a couple of days for someone's birthday, and sitting by the pool with the kids, and um, had a margarita rock up. <laughs> By the waitress, and I was just like, a bit dumb about like, wow, he has really <laughs> done his research. And then, so I was just thinking along those sort of lines, and then I actually realised that it was purely a, I had ordered a margarita pizza. Oh, and they delivered you and the cocktail. And delivered me a cocktail, but I was thinking... Your reputation proceeds. Yeah, I was just thinking, Ben has just really done his groundwork here. He has got me. But, um, I'm happy yeah. to buy Ryan a margarita anywhere in Australia. If anyone wants to buy it, oh, if they see him out, I will reimburse you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, this is never going to end. I can see it. But maybe it can become a hashtag or something. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, it's good to catch up. Mate. Yeah. Um, anything else you need to add? Anything new um, coming out? You've got gigs coming up or going to... No, nothing. As little as possible. Um, Border's still shut. Yep. No, it's been delightfully relaxing. Might be up our way before Chrissy. Yeah, no, it'd be nice to, to get up there. We're talking about coming up for for the uh, the wine fair at, at Joe's. At Joe's, yep. At Joe's place. Dormalona. Yep, that would be nice. Cool. Um, Come and see the yeah. new shed. No, I'm keen, I'm keen to see slab. that. Try your, try your um, mindfuck Shannon. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I'm not sure what we're going to do yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. I swear there's something else we're supposed to be talking about. Mm, no, it's much, it's been better doing it 
here, despite the strange surrounds to uh, yeah. to out there. Oh, it's sort of industrial. I mean, the last one was a super hot day and dusty when we drove out there. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm less tired now than I was then. I was, yeah. It was like a summer's day and yeah. I was done nothing all morning but was exhausted. And today I've been, you know, up since 4.50, slashing and blending wines and still right as rain. Good on you, mate. Mm. Well, good to see you. We'll sign off on that. Yeah. And cool. have a couple of beers and... Sounds good. All right. Thanks very much for Thanks, your mate. time. And um, yeah, it's been good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Catch ya. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Ryan O'Meara of Express Winemakers. I wish everyone a very happy new year. And I'm hoping, I don't know when, but we shall have another episode out soon. And we will let you know through Instagrams, etc. Stay well. Cheers. Bye.